Okay, we also want to study buoyancy with regard to fluent statics. And I'm going to illustrate the concept of a buoyant force. There's nothing mysterious about it, but you need to know where it comes from. So this is an important derivation, actually, and I'm going to ask you to memorize something at the end here. But um, you need to understand where the so-called concept of buoyant force comes from, and it basically comes from the concepts we've already developed. So there's nothing mysterious about buoyant force. Buoyant force is simply a convenient representation of the boundary water pressures. That's it. So let's take a look at it. So suppose we have, you know, a simple container of water, and it's only water. Nothing else is in there. And, um, the water is not moving. I am now going to just take a free body diagram of this circle shape that I drew through the water. In other words, I'm making cuts through the water like I've always done. And um, in the, 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 this circular shaped <laughs> region <laughs> is in static equilibrium because it's not moving, right? And if, it, if it's in static equilibrium, that means that uh, the upward forces on that body equal the downward forces. Now, the downward force is the weight of the water in that region. Now, what we're going to find is that the upward forces are caused by the boundary water pressure. So, in other words... Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to draw a free body diagram of this using the same principles we always have. So, you know, what do I do when I draw a free body diagram? I come in here, I do a little um, you know, copy and paste and, you know, so there it is. And then once I've drawn it, where have I made cuts? Wherever I've made cuts on it, I um uh you know, I draw I draw pressure on it you know I draw the you know the you know so I'm going to draw my boundary water pressures which are always perpendicular to the surface and acting toward it in addition to being perpendicular they have this the magnitude that we talked about which is depth times gamma w so okay so the this is a better illustration of that free body diagram. So in other words, um, here's my circular section of water. I have a weight, so there's my downward force for the weight of the water in that circular region. I, I could have made it any shape. I could have come in here and just, you know, made some sort of crazy shape. I made it a circle because it's easier to see. But it doesn't matter. I can come in here and cut water any way I want to and, um, and draw a free body diagram of that and just follow the rules. So what do I see when I draw this free body diagram? So the boundary water pressures are what? Well, at the top, it's not so deep. So I'm drawing a short arrow at the top. <laughs> and um, in the middle, the, it's a little bit longer arrow. <laughs> on both sides and um, but it's always perpendicular right to the surface so I'm always perpendicular showing compression that's what we've come up with and that's what we believe when we get to the bottom then what I have a really long arrow because that represents a much greater pressure so at the bottom so I get you know what what amounts to be this this egg-shaped boundary water pressure which I'm going to represent, you know, well, what I could do, I'm not going to, going to do this, but if I want to, rep, I want to, ideally I would like to represent that by one force, and I could do that, um, one way I could do it is to take a complex integral all the way around this surface, and, um, and, 
you know, <laughs> it's different directions, and I, I'm not going to do that because it's too complicated. Um, but I could, you know, I have to, I have to basically get, in a sense, I have to get the volume of this complex shape. Um, but then I have to account for the different directions, and so it's it's difficult. It would be a difficult integral to take, and we don't have to. And here's why. Because if I take the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero, that is what? It's the sum of the upward forces minus the weight equals zero. So in other words, um, the weight is easy to get because I can determine what that volume is of the circle. You know, if I were to specify exactly what it was. And I guess I've called it a, a ball, so let's think of it as a ball for the sake of discussion. And then I have this. I'm just representing in my equation. So this is my sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. The sum of the upward forces, I'm just going to show it as this. And then what's the weight? Well, it's the volume of the ball times the weight of the water. Right? Because that's, that's the weight of that object. And so, if I solve this equation, what do I conclude? I conclude that the sum of all those forces in the up it gives me it gives me this. It's the volume of the ball times gamma w. So I can choose to represent my this. So this is this is my buoyant force. That's what we're calling the buoyant. Force. It's just the boundary water pressures. And if that's the buoyant force, then that's the buoyant force. And of course, this acts upward. And um, because we know that, so, um, because if I have my circle with, oops, with the this pointing down as W, I have to have the sum of this going up, which we're going to call the buoyant force, which is buoyant force acting upward, and that is equal to this. So, what my conclusion is this that the boundary water pressures on a submerged body are equal to the submerged volume times the density of water or the given fluid. So if I'm doing this in oil, I could do this in oil, I could do this into any, any fluid, I'm still going to get the same result. Um, and the sum of those forces act upward. I think we can also see you can see if I look at oops, if I look at this group of forces, there's more they're more going up than going down. So, and the the whatever goes to the left equals what goes to the right. So that's not a problem. But uh, I can see so the left and the right are equal. Going left and going right are equal. Um, but there's more up than down. So the net result is an upward force of this. And what is it equal to? It's equal to the volume of this ball times gamma w. So, um, so this can be calculated by calculating that. And it's easier to calculate this than to do a complex integral to do that. So sort of a long-winded explanation, but it's important that you understand where this comes from because it plays a role in the problems that we're going to solve. It's, you have to understand where this, where the concept of buoyant force comes from so that you can apply it properly when solving problems. So that's why I ask you to memorize this or understand this and so that, so that, um, you know, the, so the boundary water pressures on a submerged body when I sum them all up, they're equal to the submerged volume times the density of water or the given fluid that we're in. 
And when I sum them all up, they all they act upward. And this is called the buoyant force. In other words, the buoyant force is the force caused by the boundary water pressures on a submerged object. So I have anything that has, you know, if I have all the boundary water pressures on the submerged object, that gives me the buoyant force that I can always calculate as that. Okay, let's look at a problem then. So now I have a ball that is filled with air. Okay, so let's look at a ball filled with air that's submerged like that. It's got a radius of one half foot. And the ball in air weighs three pounds on land. Okay. It is attached to a cable right here that is fixed to the bottom of a swimming pool. What is the tension in the cable? That's the question. Well, I know the volume of, of a ball is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram of the ball. Well, it looks a whole lot like what we just got looking, we just looked at. Except that, uh, so I've got, here's my ball. And here are my boundary water pressures. But the weight of the ball is only three pounds. So I'm, I remember I'm drawing this ball. I'm not drawing the ball that I previously showed because the ball that we previously showed oops, had, had water in it. Um, now, now our ball has air. So it's got air. It weighs three pounds though. But it has the same boundary water pressures. Well, I still, and then I, then I have the tension in this cable that's holding it down. So I've got the tension in the cable, I've got the three pounds of the weight of the ball, and I have these boundary water pressures. Well, we've already calculated those boundary water pressures. What are the boundary water pressures? It's the volume of the ball times gamma W. So that's how I can calculate them and represent them as that. So when I, you know, I can look at my free body diagram here, write the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. So what do I have? Minus three for the three pounds. Minus t for the tension in the cable. And then plus, oh, my boundary water pressures. Well, what are my boundary, and, and all that's equal to zero. So, well, what are my boundary water pressures? Well, you know, I'm showing them as that, but I know what that is. This is the volume of the ball, and this is density of water, gamma W. So um, I simply put those into this equation, and I solve for T, and I find that T is equal to 29.67 pounds. So what you need to recognize is that this is the this is the buoyant force and this is how we can represent the buoyant force so if i wanted to i could draw this free body diagram like this i've got 3 pounds i've got the tension in the cable but then I've also got, working on it, I've got um, F B, F buoyant, also write it as F buoyant, which is equal to the volume of the ball times gamma W. So that's another way to draw this free body diagram. But for this problem, I just wanted to, I want to show this one so that you have an understanding of where this comes from. I've just found that students, once they see this buoyant force, after a while they go, where's that come from? And they don't understand where it comes from, so I'm going to draw it like that, at least for this problem, so you see where, what it is. It's not magic. And uh, 
It is simply the result of the concepts we've already developed. Okay, so you work this one. This time now the ball is only halfway submerged. And um, same ball, same ball. It's only halfway submerged and it's got the cable. You pause the video here, you solve this one based on what you know. Okay. Well now what? Now, I'm going to take the free body diagram of the ball and it's going to be the three pounds again the tension in the cable again, but now the boundary water pressures only go like that. Well, how do I, this is, again, it would be an odd integral, we could do it, but it would be tough, so instead of that, what do we do? We do the the volume submerged, remember it's the submerged volume, times gamma W is equal to my buoyant force. The buoyant force being these boundary water pressures. So, I've got my minus 3, I've got my minus T, plus, and what is it? What are these boundary water pressures? Well, it's the submerged volume. Now it's half. It's half. One half four thirds pi r cubed times gamma w equals zero. I solve for t and I get t is equal to thirteen point three four pounds. So, like I say, the other way to illustrate this would be with this force FB, but you need to know where that FB came from. So Another way to draw this free body diagram would be, would be this, where FB, the buoyant force, is the volume of submerged times gamma W. Now notice, when the ball is completely submerged, when the ball is completely submerged, I have 29.67. If it's halfway submerged, it's not half of that. We have to go through the calculation and figure out that no, it's 13.34 pounds. Okay, now I've got one. It's rectangular. And um, so I have this rectangular shaped object. This is what it looks like in 3D. 7 feet, 2 feet, 2 feet. And um, I have oil and water, and here's the seven feet, and what we don't see is the two feet by two feet. Now, um, it weighs 50 pounds, and it's held down by a cable here in a combination of oil and water. So how do we handle that? The density of the oil is 80% that of water. Again, we want to find the cable tension. So, based on what I told, what you what you know at this point, give it your best shot here, and uh, draw the free body diagram of this and get the cable tension. Okay, so pause the video here and work this problem as well as you can. Okay, so now I'm going to have two buoyant forces, one for the buoyant force in water, one for the buoyant force in oil. So I take the submerged, the volume in water times gamma W for the water portion. I take the volume in oil times the unit weight of the oil. So I get both of these buoyant forces. So Submerged in the water is 4 feet, times 2 times 2. Submerged in the oil is 3 feet, times 2 times 2. The 2 times 2 from this portion. And then the density of water is 62.4,
the density of the oil is 0.8 times 62.4. So I have the buoyant force in the water, I have the buoyant force in the oil. And so I have the 50 pounds acting downward, I have the oil buoyant force, I have the water buoyant force going upward, notice they go upward, and uh, the tension going downward, and I plug these in, the um, 599 upward, 998.4 upward, minus 50 for the downward, minus T, I solve for T, and I get uh, 1547 pounds. Okay, now we have a person who weighs 153 pounds walks to the bottom of a swimming pool, okay? So how do you walk to the bottom of the swimming pool? You have to blow out all the air from your lungs so that your body is, um, your body sinks. Normally a human a person with a full with full lungs will float. So um, anyway, so we're envisioning that somebody's blown out all the air from his or her lungs and walks to the bottom of the swimming pool. On the bottom of the swimming pool, there's a scale. And um, the scale reads eight pounds. The person weighs 153 pounds in the air on land and the question is what is the volume of this person's body so the the scale reads eight pounds and the person weighs 153 pounds in air and um so what what is the volume of the person's body that's the question okay so using the principles that we've developed go ahead and solve this problem. Draw a free body diagram of the person, of course, and remember how do we handle a scale? What's a scale? Scale is a spring. A scale is a spring where we know the force in the spring. So, okay. Okay, so we're going to take a free body diagram. Well, I'm going to cut right next to the person. I guess I can't, can't see this, but I'm cutting right next to the person and through the scale here so that uh, I'm not cutting the water here. I guess I'm a little bit, didn't mean to do that, but uh, so we're cutting right next to the person and through the scale. So when I do that, what do I have? Well, I've got the 153 pounds because that's what the person weighs. I have a buoyant force going upward on the person and then I made a cut through the scale, but the scale reads eight pounds, so I know the force in the scale and that is eight pounds, so it's going upward. It's compression, right? Because scale always, this you know, sort of bathroom scale always reads compression. So I have eight pounds compression, meaning it's pointing toward the body. And um, so my, so I can look at this free body diagram, and I can compute what does the buoyant force have to be? Well, it's 153 minus 8, or minus 153 plus 8, plus FB equals 0. I solve for FB. Now FB is what? Volume of the body times gamma W. I replace that with volume of the body gamma W, and gamma W is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, and I get that the volume of the body is 2.3 cubic feet. So notice this is something that sinks. It still has the buoyant force on it even though it's sunk to the bottom of the pool. And uh, you've all experienced this. If you walk to the bottom of a swimming pool, you know, you don't feel much stress or pressure on the bottom of your foot. There's not much weight on the bottom of your feet. There's not much. It doesn't touch. <laughs> so you can envision that it might only say eight pounds on your scale at the bottom of the swimming pool. It's not much at all. So, um, so whether the body 
floats, wants to float, or whether it wants to sink, the buoyant forces are still acting on it. That's what that's what this that's one of the things you have to recognize. And that makes sense, right? Because there are boundary water pressures. Whether they're whether the body has sunk or is being held down or whatever. Okay, here's another homework problem. I have two boys, each weighing 150 pounds, are con constructing a square raft that is one foot thick. Okay, so here's their raft. It's one foot thick. They're going to stand on the raft. We don't know the dimension here, so, but the raft material has a density of 40 pounds per cubic foot. Now, that density, of course, has got to be less than the density of water if it's going to, if it's going to float. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, um, the raft is going to sink if it has a density greater than that of water. We know that, um, you know, you learned that in your physics class. If, if something has a density greater than that of water, it's going to sink. If it has a density less than that of water, it's going to float. So what should be the width of the raft so that the boys do not get their feet wet? So in other words, in plan view, it's a square raft, D by D. It's one foot thick. And so the worst situation is such that it sinks just so that it's at the level of the water here as I've shown it. Uh, if it sinks any more than that, the water is going to come on, come on to the raft and the boys are going to get their feet wet. So we don't want that to happen. So the question is, what size of raft do we need so that basically this situation is in equilibrium? So use what we have learned and... Um, work this problem. So pause the video here and work this problem. Okay, so here's our free body diagram in a sense. <laughs> That's our free body diagram. Each boy weighs 150 pounds, so they're on it. Then what? We have the weight, we have the weight of the raft. Well, the weight of the raft is the density of the raft times the volume of the raft. So um, the volume of the raft is d squared times... Um, okay, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe, oh, it's one and a half feet thick. Oops, okay, so a slight mistake here. So uh, this shouldn't read one foot thick. It should read 1.5 feet thick. So my mistake. So if you want to rework this problem... Um, with 1.5 feet. That is a mistake here. So um, let's just correct that. So go back. You can work this. This is actually supposed to be 1.5 feet thick. So um, okay. So the volume of the raft is 1.5 d squared. And um, the weight of the raft, so that's the volume of the raft. Oops, I see. Let me just change this. 1.5 feet. And so, um, 1.5 d squared, that's the volume of the raft. That means the weight of the raft is 1.5 d squared times the density of the raft, which is 40 pounds per cubic foot. And that gives us that the weight of the raft is 60 d squared. So I've got my 150 pounds for each boy. The weight of the raft is 60 d squared. Now what is the, what is the buoyant force here? Well, it's going to be the... Um, the volume of the raft times gamma w. And the volume of the raft times gamma w, 1.5 d squared, 
is 93.6 d squared. So I have, for the weight of the raft, 60 d squared going down, but of course the buoyant force is bigger than the weight of the raft because that means because it floats. And so I've got 60 d squared going down. I've got 93.6 d squared going up. The two boys, 150 pounds. And then, of course, what do I do? It's the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. I just look at this. You can see that that goes into this. I, the only unknown there is d. I solve for the d. It's 2.99 feet, so it's only three feet. So it doesn't take a big raft, so, you know, <laughs> we'll be better off. Uh, not much room if it's three feet by three feet for two boys, so they can make it bigger than that and get it to float. So um, that is, uh, you know, that, they could make it thin. They, you know, they, could, they can now design this raft in a different way. Maybe they don't need it so thick and they want it to be wider than, um, and less thick. So that's how, that would be the design of this raft here. Okay, here's another problem. Now, in this particular case, I've got a gate here. And um, it is, I've got this ball hanging from it. So in other words, I've got a pin at this location, I've got a roller at this location, and I've got a ball hanging down there. And the weight of the ball is, is 20 kilonewton, and it has a radius of half a meter. And I want to know the reaction here at this, at this point. What is my B perpendicular? In other words, what is the reaction right there? So now I have two things going on. I've got this ball completely submerged. I've got the boundary water pressures on this gate, so I have to sort of put together the different things that I've learned. And, um, okay, so go ahead and work this one as well as you can. In other words, you've got, what, I, what you need to do is take, create a free body diagram of this. You have to figure, well, you gotta figure out, figure out the tension in this cable, um, and, um, and the boundary water pressures on this wall to solve this problem. Okay, so pause the video here and do this one. Okay, so um, there are different ways to do it. I can find out, first let's look at the ball. Well, it's 200 kilonewtons going down and the buoyant force on the ball going up. Well, what's the buoyant force on the ball going up is the volume of the ball times gamma w, and it's four-thirds pi r cubed. And uh, in metric, it's 9.8 kilonewtons per cubic meter. And I get the, um, the buoyant force. It's not written really well here. The buoyant force there is um, 5.13 kilonewtons and then I have the boundary water pressures on that wall I know that the depth I've given I've been given this is eight meters down below the water surface so it's zero at the top here it's going to be eight times nine point eight at the bottom and of course it's perpendicular Everything is perpendicular to the surface. So there is my triangle at, at point A. I've got an A, Y, and AX, but I don't ask for that. I've got the B perpendicular here. And, um, and I have to do a little bit of um, looking at angles and things like that. But um, first I can, get the, I can get the total force here is what? It's um, one half the base times the height, and um, we didn't give um, a depth or sorry, uh, a distance perpendicular to the. Um, I didn't give a 
a distance perpendicular to the paper here, so we're going to take, so we take one meter. When a distance isn't given, just take one meter. It doesn't matter if it's, um, yeah, I guess I didn't get it, so we take one meter. Okay. But no matter, we'll say, um, uh, so we want the force of the water to be, uh, you know, it's the 78.4, so it's one half, 78.4 times um, this distance here, which ends up to be 16 meters, because just by geometry, I know that um, L sine 30 degrees, the angle here is given to be 30 degrees, so um, 8 over sine 30 is 16, so that's this length right here. So we have um, the force in the water ends up to be 627.2 kilonewtons. I, I should have said one meter perpendicular to the paper, but I didn't. So um, that's my fault. But um, okay, so the um, so we get the force, force, so we get the total force here, and, um, and the, if you do some math, you can figure out what this distance is. It's 6 over the tangent of 30 is 10.4 meters, so when I take my moments, I know that's 10.4 meters. I know that, um, uh, the so okay so let's just do our calculation now and so some angles involved here but um so i'm going to take moments about point a and um and i have the weight is 200 kilonewtons i have 5.13 is the buoyant force acting upward and then we calculated that to be 627.2 where does it go it's one third of 16 5.33, it's perpendicular like that. And so when I take moments about A, I have the uh, minus 200 times the 10.4, and I've got the 5.13 times the 10.4, and then the 627.2, again, there's some geometry involved, is 5.33, minus 4, because, you know, that distance is 4, and, um, and I have B perpendicular times 4 equals 0. I solve for B perpendicular, I get 298 kilonewtons. So, um, let's just make sure it's, uh, it's, uh, uh this is, uh, use one meter perpendicular to the paper here. Okay, we'll stop there.